father dear. I have time seer. You speak of her inside. Life in exile is a constant theme in the Irish song tradition, whether being forced to leave for lack of employment or on the run for the murder of a ruthless landlord. But a song rarely sung on these shores is that of the foreign political refugee making a home in Ireland. So why did you abandon it? Yes. Yes. A lawyer and a journalist was immediately before the war engaged in purely cultural activities. Engaged in cultural activities. Cultural activities. Yes. We paid a visit to Alwyn and Erwin Fuere at their childhood home in Ockrespiog County, Galway, to learn about their father, Jan, a prominent Breton nationalist who, after World War II, was forced to leave his native Brittany and find shelter on the Connemara coast. This used to be a kind of a fisherman's hut where the first Breton who came and set up here. So he used to live in this kitchen. With his wife. Uh, with his wife. And then, and then the, the house grew up around it. My yeah. father built the house around it. He was someone who really had a mission in life, which was to get recognition for the Breton culture, the Breton language at a time when the language was forbidden by the state, by the French authorities. And then he was imprisoned, like many other Bretons, after the war, under the accusation of collaboration with the Germans. Now, this was a, a, a general accusation against many Bretons to discredit the Breton movement, which had been very strong before the war. It's true that there were a few Bretons who did uh, collaborate with the Germans, but the vast majority didn't, and they were persecuted purely because of their political beliefs, and my father was unfortunately one of those. So uh, he chose the path of exile because he felt that this was probably the only way in which to defend his position. The timeline would have been imprisonment shortly after the, the, the war, and mm -hmm. then out on bail, you know, so it was nearly a year, wasn't it? With, a year, with, with yes, lots of other yes. Bretons. And then out on bail for about three weeks, and in that time had to decide whether he was going to go on the run or whether he was going to stay. And knowing that the situation was not looking good, he went on the run for several months. Six months. During the yeah. time you were born. You mm -hmm. must have been conceived in those three weeks, actually. But mm -hmm. Probably. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, I feel very fortunate that yeah. we ended up here, I must say, because I don't know whether it would have had such an interesting life growing up in Brittany. It would be much more bourgeois life, probably. Mm. Maybe, yes. <laughs> it was really so poor, the conditions here and all that. There were no roads to speak of. It was a struggle. The electricity came in 1958. Communication was so difficult, and we have in our files an uh, interview that our father gave. It's an audio recording which uh, a man who worked with us at the time, he managed to record the phone conversation where my father and the journalist could not hear one another, but we can hear both of them. And my father is trying to explain the That's Breton movement over this like impossible, impossible line. line. In a region historically starved for employment, the people of Connemara are no strangers to exile, a recurring theme in their song culture. We met with local singer Sarah Grealish to learn more. Years and years ago in Connemara, the only work is if you had a boat, and there was no other work, especially for women. I left a ground. Maybe when I was 17, I went to London. My rent and taxes were too high. I could not them redeem. And that's the cruel reason why 
I left all skibbery. I find it it's the only ballad song that has more of the shadows in it because you, you put your feelings in there because of the story and the song. It's the father and son talking um, to each other in the song. He was always talking about Ireland to the son and telling him, you know, how he loved Ireland. And then the son grew up, he said to his father, you're always talking about Ireland. If you loved Ireland so well, he said, why did you leave? And this, this is how we say the song. And that's another reason why I left all Skibbery. Yes. He found it on the west coast. Where was it? Where he found it? On the west coast. On the west coast, yes. A selfish business. A selfish business. Yes. Basically, he had to open the book to find out, you know, all about lobster fishing and everything. And I mean, it was a great, tremendous uh, tribute to him that he achieved so much in the face of not just adversity, but also uh, the transport problems, uh, all of that. I thought while well, then he would, at the end of the day, sit up in his study and write. Right, and, yes. And yes. edit a newspaper for Britain. Yes. Much of Jan's work in the Breton movement was for the recognition of the Breton language. We travelled to Jan's hometown of Gangon in Brittany, where his lasting legacy is a small archive of precious Breton books and texts. Here we met with Yves Mervan to discuss the years during the war. He created a daily newspaper, La Bretagne. He created this at the beginning of the occupation. Of course, Jan Fouere has had a relationship with the German, and specifically uh, the propaganda Staffel, who controlled uh, what was published in the newspaper. But this is not specific at all to Jan Ferry. Every uh, newspaper has been prosecuted after the war. The war period and the Breton links to Nazi occupation have been a source of local shame ever since, causing many to abandon their sense of Breton identity. It wasn't until the 1970s that a Breton folk revival reinstated a sense of pride in the region. We sat down with Clarice Lavenant, a renowned singer who grew up in the aftermath of this Breton reawakening. Could you speak to us a bit about your Breton heritage and say how important that is to you? L'identité, oui, c'est après c'est quelque chose qu'on découvre souvent petit à petit, ce qu'on appelle la conscience bretonne, parce que quand j'étais enfant, je me souviens de mon grand-père qui avait quitté Morlaix, c'est ville de Bretagne, du Finistère Nord, et qui était parti travailler à Paris dans la capitale de, de la France, comme beaucoup de Bretons qui sont partis euh, pour aller travailler dans des villes plus grandes. Et donc, il m'a parlé de la Bretagne toute mon enfance. Et je, quand j'étais enfant, je ne comprenais pas forcément. Et puis après, en grandissant, en quittant moi-même euh, la Bretagne, en revenant, euh, j'ai commencé à, à comprendre ce que c'était. Je... On a une, une conscience qui se réveille. Je me suis dit, mais je viens de quelque part aussi et le fait d'être partie loin m'a ramenée en Bretagne et je me suis sentie euh, bretonne. Euh, J'ai peut-être compris ce sentiment, ce que c'était de se sentir euh, breton en fait. Et notamment, euh, nous on a ce qu'on appelle une, on a une, une région un peu euh, qui a été euh, donc tronquée. On a une partie de la Bretagne qui manque depuis longtemps, depuis la 1941, depuis l'époque de depuis Pétain, en fait, qui a enlevé cette partie de la Bretagne. Et quand vous regardez la Bretagne sur une carte, il manque vraiment, une... c'est comme un puzzle, et puis il manque toute une partie. Et euh, c'est quelque chose de douloureux pour nous, euh, quand, on, quand on voit déjà cette image. Et puis euh, aussi, ce qui est douloureux, c'est que ça dure, c'est que plus le temps passe. Parce qu'avec la poésie, quelquefois, 
c'est plus facile que la politique de, de dire des choses ou peut-être euh, d'émouvoir, parce que nous, on est ému, quelque chose nous tient à cœur, et puis les gens, euh, souvent, euh, ressentent aussi une émotion, et puis ça peut être... J'avais cinq enfants réunis en un même pays Entre la pierre et la mer Cinq enfants de riz dont j'étais la source mère lorsque j'étais entière. J'avais cinq enfants aujourd'hui, il me manque une fille. C'est bien plus qu'un morceau de terre, c'est un bout de ma chair. Oui, alors vous connaissez bien la, la mélodie qui est une grande mélodie euh, irlandaise, je dis flou de fer. Et euh, d'ailleurs, au passage, j'aime beaucoup euh, Céline de Connor, euh, qui fait partie aussi de, de, de nombreux interprètes qui nous chantent leur propre émotion, et se servir de l'image euh, d'une mère finalement qui avait euh, cinq enfants, puis qui en, qui en perd un ou qu'on lui prend, et qui se sent euh, effectivement incomplète, comme quand on peut perdre un enfant. Et dans cette chanson, euh, c'est ce que je raconte en disant euh, euh, que j'étais une mère complète, donc une terre euh, unifiée, unie, et puis qui, qui espère qu'un jour, euh, elle retrouvera cette cinquième fille, et puis d'être comme les doigts d'une main euh, réunie. Lorsque j'étais entière, j'avais cinq enfants aujourd'hui. Rendez-moi cette fille. Oh, Christ. I find in it a very similar message to a lot of Irish songs. And there's, there's one in particular um, called uh, Four Green Fields. Similarly to the, the five regions of Brittany or the five departments of Brittany, uh, there is, uh, of the four provinces of Ireland, there is one that is the sort of disputed territory. And, and, uh, and in that, he writes a song, a very, very similar idea from the perspective of a mother. Uh, in this case, she has four fields uh, and, uh, mm. and, and, and sons who protect those fields for her. And uh, I think that the last verse goes, What have I now? Said the fine old woman. What have I now? And this proud old woman did say, I have four green fields. One of them's in bondage, in stranger. People around here were very, very supportive and mm. helped yeah. my mother a lot with the difficulties she would have had. And I could see the scars, uh, quite severe scars on her and then kind of on their relationship ultimately as well because she had asked my father to marry her and he had said, well, as long as you never reproach me for putting Brittany first, <laughs> she would always remind me that she had agreed to it. She, she married she, my father yeah. and she married Brittany. Yeah. Well, bloom once again, said she. Oh, quel tiers, amour à glème, fénos, digne d'entrer dans l'estrine. One of the reasons we're in Brittany today is because there was a, uh, a very prominent Breton nationalist called Jan Fouere, and he lived in Ireland. It's sort of through that link that we've come here today and to discuss the, the notion of Breton nationalism or Breton regionalism um, and that kind of complex history um, and how that relates to Ireland and, and what, what those similarities are. Um, I'm curious, what is the, the feeling uh, about Fouere and that period il y a eu une certaine honte, c'est-à-dire qu'à une époque, après la guerre et, et la langue bretonne, du coup, ont, 
on a souffert parce qu'il y a eu effectivement euh, une petite part euh, qui a, parce que le, le régime euh, allemand avait promis, euh, donc une petite part de, de gens qui ont collaboré avec l'Allemagne, et puis alors qu'il y avait beaucoup, beaucoup de, plus de résistants en, en Bretagne. Et, et ce qui s'est passé, c'est qu'après, il y a eu un amalgame, euh, c'est que tous ceux qui parlaient breton étaient forcément euh, liés à l'ennemi et qu'il a fallu beaucoup de temps, euh, parce qu'après la guerre, il y a eu ce qu'on appelle la chasse aux régionalistes, et, euh, et que ça a été très long, et qu'aujourd'hui encore, il peut y avoir des... Euh, on peut penser que quand... Beaucoup moins, évidemment, on a passé, mais ça a fait beaucoup, beaucoup de, de tort, et que maintenant, au jour d'aujourd'hui, euh, la langue bretonne commence à... à L'histoire est passant, on ne fait plus euh, cet amalgame, finalement, puisqu'en plus, la Bretagne est une terre où où le Front National est à le moins de voix. Donc euh, voilà, ça a été une histoire euh, douloureuse et puis des, des amalgames qui n'étaient pas euh, heureux du tout. <rire> Jan passed away in 2010, at the age of 111, denying up to his death any collaboration with Nazi Germany. There are many things which set Fouary apart from Ireland's history of exile, but the deathbed wish to be laid to rest on your native soil is something that any number of Irish men and women can relate to, as we can hear in the Connemara song, Or on Wienshire. The story of that song, the woman, she composed the song on her deathbed, hoping that her family would be there around her when she would die. So she planned her funeral. She was from Carna, and she um, was married back in um, Littermore, Littercather. But her wish that she wanted to be buried back in Carna, in Wienish, uh, with her family. But uh, she didn't get our wish because of the bad weather. They could not take her by boat. So she had to be buried in Lettercala, Lettermore. <laughs> You think there was, there was some sort of affinity he would have a place like Connemara and its similarities to Brittany? Definitely. Absolutely, absolutely, in many respects. Not just the, 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 the nature, but the culture and, and the life, you know, how difficult, how tough life was for people here as was in Brittany, because Brittany was a little bit like the west of Ireland in, in terms of France and the economic development. So, and the maritime um, life. As yes, well. and the maritime life. This always imbued his and my both my parents' whole livelihood, and it's one reason why we made sure that on his grave in his resting place in Gango in Brittany, we have put shells that we've collected here all along the coast, mm. and we've put there to underline Connection. the link, the <laughs> connection between Brittany and Connemara. The last 10 years of his life, he lived there. He wanted to end his life in Brittany. He prepared his grave long before yes, he died. Yes, yes, he had and my, my designed the monument. The, yeah, the, and put it up and everything. Yeah. My partner went over there with his father uh, to visit, and uh, they said, you know, we'll take you out. I said, and, he, and my father said, where would you like to go? And my partner said, well, somewhere special, somewhere important to the family. And he brought them to his grave. <laughs> A lot has changed in Brittany since Fouari was active, its nationalist movements rising and falling as the decades wore on. Today, though, it seems the tides may be changing in Brittany, with the national anthem finally gaining official status. Alors, l'hymne breton est devenu officiel il y a vraiment peu de temps. Ça a été acté là il y a quelques jours, 2022, alors qu'il a été chanté pour la première fois, je crois, en 1900. D'ailleurs, c'est un chant que, qui est très chanté de nos jours, hein, qui a été interdit longtemps, mais qui est très interprété. J'aime bien le chanter en fin de concert. Puis en général, c'est quand même un chant qu'on chante euh, debout. <rire> en général, même les gens sont, sont debout. C'est l'hymne. Ni à galon car on peut en Dispon crais à brésel, on t'a douquet mat, à ce qu'il y a ces vitis, au oh, 
Je crois qu'on peut dire aujourd'hui euh, à tous ceux qui ont labouré, alors euh, musicalement, ont euh, bien s'aimé. Et il se trouve que là, il y a plein de choses en Bretagne. La musique est très vivante. C'est une des terres musicales où il y a le, bah, le plus de festivals. Et c'est une terre vraiment ouverte au reste du monde et pas du tout euh, une terre repliée sur elle-même. Je pense que c'est c'est positif en tout cas, c'est une terre euh, ouverte à, à demain et aux autres. L'Irlande, c'est un petit peu comme notre, notre rêve finalement. On a effectivement des points communs, des histoires, euh, histoires qu'on pourrait rapprocher comme ça à certains moments. Et que nous, l'Irlande, c'est toujours pour nous hein, une terre d'espoir. Ça nous donne. Euh, on a ce rêve au fond de nous que, que vous, vous avez aussi. Euh, j'ai envie de dire réaliser alors résoudre ma bro oh ma bro mégare ma bro trama vos Ma pro, ravez-o, digabestre, ma pro.